I went to college because I wanted to be a golf bro. And I was offered a partial golf scholarship to go to UW Stevens Point, University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point. And I went up there. This would have been the fall of 1987. And I started playing on the golf team. About midway through that fall season, we had a weekend off. And I went back to Madison, Wisconsin. And I happened upon a a bunch of players. One guy was named Steve Stricker. He's he's been on the PGA Tour for years. One is Jerry Kelly. These are guys I played against in high school. They were a few years in front of me. Steve went to University of Illinois. Jerry Kelly went to Hartford to play play hockey and golf. And then they both made a ton of money later. But it was really a hard lesson because I watched them on the driving range. And I said, wow, these guys are really a lot better than me. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't realize they were that much better than me. But, but you know, practicing confirmation bias, I said, but I, I'm better than them around the greens. So, we, you know, when the scores come out, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to show them. You know, they went out in the morning. I went out in the afternoon and saw all the scores. And they were just a lot better than me. And I ended up doing a bunch of data crunching. And I realized that everything I was told as a kid, because remember, I grew up in Wisconsin, and that's Vince Lombardi country. And Vince Lombardi is a venerable coach of the Green Bay Packers. When people win the Super Bowl, the trophy is called the Lombardi Trophy. So I was raised in the shadows of Vince Lombardi, who famously said, winners never quit, and quitters never win. So in my parents' taught me that time and time again, Johnny, you you have grit, you stick with it. So it was really hard for me to say, that dream is done. I'm going to have to quit that dream. I'm going to fulfill the golf scholarship. And I I went and played and, and I had a very successful college golf career. But from that day on, my dream was to become an economist. And, and I could, I was still going to invest in golf, but it wasn't going to be all in on golf. It's going to be all in on golf and all in on, on econ and, and learning about economics and how I can use it as a trade when I quote grow up. But, but for me, what I see in the business world and in government is that people don't quit enough. They don't quit enough because They've been taught not to quit. They also don't quit enough because they don't understand or appreciate the opportunity cost of time. You know, when you think about the person who moves to a different job or they move to a different apartment, nearly every time they're doing it because something bad happened in the workplace or something bad happened in the apartment. That's all well and fine, but you should also be moving when you get better opportunities. And you should always be looking at your opportunity set. We don't do that. We don't look at our opportunities until our own lot in life is soiled. And that's too late most of the time because a lot of opportunities have come and gone. So that's called opportunity cost because we don't realize that if I'm working on this idea with all of my might, that there's an idea out there that I can't work on. And we tend to neglect that opportunity cost of time. So we, we did this large scale experiment. I helped Steve Levitt design it and run it that had people flip a coin. And if it comes up heads, you know, they, they had a tough decision in life, whether it was a job, a relationship, uh, an apartment, whatever. If it came up heads, they need to change. If it comes up tails, they don't in our Freakonomics experiment. And what you find is when you track them over time is that most of the people are much happier that they made the change. So they didn't realize that there were greener pastures out there until they were sort of forced to do it. So that's the optimal quitting chapter. And the reason why, again, people don't like to say the Q word. So what I say is call an audible, right? We, we always call an audible in football. We always pivot. When people pivot or call an audible in football, they're glorified. But when you say I'm quitting, you're chastised. So I, I think part of this is just reframing 
when you quit. And we should understand that it's pivoting or calling an audible in your life. That's the optimal quitting chapter. How would you give a pep talk to someone, could be a CEO, could be a student, could be anyone really, who's dealing with, let's just call it a data set or just a life experience that it, that is not black and white. And not to imply that your experience is black and white, but if you if you go into the gym for basketball practice and you're standing next to Michael Jordan, you're like, okay, <laughs> this is, there's not much debate here at some point. Like that is just a superior player. And maybe I should choose a game where I can be number one or number two or something like that. There are many life circumstances or business circumstances where it's kind of a, or it appears to be like a 51%, 49% type of situation. And they're like, well, maybe if we continue to split test and iterate and, you know, I've read of all these success stories could be survivorship bias, but nonetheless, you know, there are all these studies of like pivot, pivot, pivot. And then, oh my God, now you have Twitter. Yeah. What do you say to those people? Or uh, can you think of a real world example where it was, it was tougher to kind of determine whether to quit or not? No, you're right. You're right. In, in many cases, we, we sort of have these tweeners where, you know, the idea shows some signs, you know, and, and just enough to keep me going. Yeah. And the, the, job, the job shows some promise, just enough to kind of keep me going. So I, I always say that you don't want to quit unless you know you have a good option to go to. So, and, and that means that you should periodically, say once a month, look at your options and, and make sure that the option is real and also make sure that it is along the lines of your comparative advantage. So there not only needs to be something that you can go to, that's something that exists, but also a comparative advantage is what are you good at? And what are you passionate about doing? The long run is filled with success only if you can wake up every morning and be passionate about something that you're good at. That's your comparative advantage. So I would say never move or rotate unless you know that where, what you're rotating to, you're good at and you're going to love. And also that it's a real option. Otherwise, there's no reason just quitting to quit. I, I, I think that there are a lot of tweener cases where it could still work out. The problem is, is that every time the Olympics comes, when this is aired, the Olympics will be on. And there will be a story every night about the person who persevered, mm -hmm. the person who had to go and work at the grocery store, and then they drove in the forklift and the in the basement of a cheese factory. And lo and behold, that person has become a great bobsledder. Yep. And then the mom is on there saying, I love Johnny. And the dad is on there saying how we knew Johnny would never quit. And, and these are great feel-good stories. And that causes us to want to persevere. But where is the story for the billions of people who went down the hole and they kept going down the same hole every day to a mine that had no gold in it. Yeah. Where, where's that story written? Yeah. I've never read one. So we don't realize that there are billions of people who have tried and tried and tried, but they keep hitting their head against the same wall and they never succeeded. That's lost opportunity right there.